we're going to go from the world of FDA approved to the world of ex experimental right now. And the, and the real answer is we don't know. We don't know. every The answer to every question is going to be we don't know. We think we may understand, but there's no definitive. Um, but it does seem promising as a treatment for joint arthritis. And I'll kind of go through some of the studies we have. Um, the first question is, you know, what is PRP? And, and anyone who's seen me as a patient knows that, that I'm a needle guy. It tends to be what I do, you know, I do start conservative with the physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medicines, but the next step beyond that is to try to do some injections to get people feeling better. So hence the happy needle that's right there. Um, originally, PRP was developed in the 70s for dentistry and horses. Um, and someone decided that maybe we should use it for musculoskeletal injuries for people. And, it, and it's actually worked out fairly well. Um, the goal is to increase the healing response on the patient. What you do is you draw a small amount of blood. There are multiple systems. They vary system to system. It's anywhere between 10 cc's to 30 cc's. And then you spin a centrifuge. Again, varying uh, speeds, varying time that you spin it. Um, and you end up with a concentrate with platelets in it that you remove and then inject into the area you want to heal. Um, and this is a basic picture of what you end up with. If you had 10 cc's, um, the top level is the plasma. Um, the bottom level is the red blood cells and the stuff that we want is right here in the buffy coat uh, where you have uh, platelets as well as some white blood cells. And what this does, you can imagine when you hurt yourself, the first response is the, to get at the platelets activated. And so what we do is we take those platelets, put into an area without good blood supply, and they release growth factors and cytokines. And, and I'm sure everyone knows all of these right here, so I'm not going to go through all of that. But it's just a lot of things get released and activated. Um, this results in chemotaxis of the inflammatory cells, and then the local progenitor cells get uh, proliferation and, and healing basically starts. So where do we use it is the first question. We use it in tendons, muscles, and ligaments. Again, the jury is still out, so we don't know where it works well. We, we think it works well in epicondylitis. There's a study out there that says it does not work as well in, in Achilles, but I've seen it work well in Achilles, so we don't really know where to use it. Um, and that's what we're trying to figure out. So someone said, well, why not joints? And this is where we are. Um, so Dr. Kessel just talked to you about hyaluronic acid and some of the studies that I've shown compare it to hyaluronic acid because while the gold standard is still probably steroid injections, they're looking to, to see where the use, this can come into use. Um, so there was a study in arthroscopy by Kahn and, and what they did is they looked at 150 patients and they categorized them into cartilage degenerative lesion, early osteoarthritis and severe osteoarthritis. And then they divide that into, uh, into three groups of 50, um, evenly divide, and then injected one group with low molecular weight hyaluronic acid, one group with high molecular weight, and then one group with PRP. And, and the way they did the PRP is they drew 150 milliliters of blood at once, a lot of blood, spun it, and then divided it into five, uh, four different samples um, of five milliliters. And froze those. So they injected the first visit and then froze the other two and then unfroze them. Uh, so it's three shots, two weeks apart. Um, sometimes no's are good, right? So, you know, no lines for gas is good. No trees on the wires is good. <laughs> they acknowledge there's a lot of no's in this study, unfortunately. Um, there's no randomization in the study. There was no standardization of the injection technique. There were three different hospitals. Three different people did the injections. There's no placebo, no blinding, no post-procedural protocol. They said, you know, you can exercise, but no one went out and said, this is what everyone should do. But on the good side, there was no significant difference in the age group, sex, and pathology grades. So they, they standardized as best they could, but there's, there's limitations, and they acknowledge that. Um, they followed patients at two and six months. The reason six months was because hyaluronic acid is improved for six months. So they figured the end result of hyaluronic acid should be the end result. And then did a different sort of pain scales as to how patients felt and moved around. For severe osteoarthritis, no one got better. None of the categories for any of the hyaluronic acids or PRP. Uh, for high weight molecular uh, uh, hyaluronic acid, it actually was worse at two and six months, interesting enough. At two months, the low molecular weight hyaluronic acid were similar between that and PRP, but at six months for the, actually this is a typo, it's not early, it's, it's the mild, the cartilage uh, degeneration. So even the lowest of the category, uh, the PRP people actually showed improvement at six months, they continued to do well. Um, 
They also then looked at the age of people and they found that people that were less than 50, the low molecular weight, high hyaluronic acid and pure P were more effective than high, uh, high weight. Um, and, and in 50 year olds and old and older, everything was equal across the board. So basically what they found was PRP may be effective for people who with really early osteoarthritis and less than 50 years old in, in trying to get them with decreased pain and function. Um, there was another study by Sp uh, uh, Spakova uh, who basically did the same experiment with 120 people. Uh, they randomly just divide them into one hyaluronic acid group, one PRP group. And then at six months, they showed that there was more improvement with the PRP than hyaluronic acid. Sorry, Dr. Kessel, I didn't want to, but. Um, they didn't separate out severity of osteoarthritis. So they didn't do what the other people did to grade that out, but they did find there was some uh, difference and improvement. Uh, Journal of Sports Medicine uh, looked at a basic science study where they cultured human osteoarthritic chondrocytes um, and then looked at how PRP uh, relastase affected that. And basically what they found is one of the major pathways of osteoarthritis was decreased by the use of PRP. So high percentage PRP relastase decreased some of the, uh, um, the pathogenesis of osteoarthritis. Um, and then Lepros found that uh, PRP actually led to an attenuation of arthritic changes in the synovium and cartilage of a pig model of rheumatoid arthritis. So they basically took pig's knees and then induced osteoarthritis and found that PRP decreased that, that inflammatory response. Um, and they found that actually was, it was stronger response in the cartilage than the synovium. So there's some pretty decent data out there that things are going on when you do PRP. But the summary of PRP is this, it's experimental. It's not FDA approved for any treatment, including the ones that we commonly use it for, but it is being done all over the country. And we're trying to figure out where it works well and where it doesn't work well. Um, it shows promise in early degenerative changes, probably not so good in people who have severe arthritis because it's not gonna regrow cartilage. It just may help to, to sort of heal an injury, but it's not gonna repair what's already been damaged. Um, but the bottom line is we need bigger and better studies to show its effectiveness. Uh, but it certainly is an option out there until we can get the Star Trek uh, tricorders and fix everyone you know, without doing anything needle-wise. So thank you very much. <laughs>